so this is the place where uh, someone had to come along and um, and propose a new idea that that together with everything else we know about this setup might actually be able to explain it might be able to explain why this is a stable and um, I guess we can explain it two different ways um, let's see what treatment do I want to give um, let me give you Bohr's trim uh, um, uh, uh, let me give you the solution to this problem by a guy named Niels Bohr. So um, this is what he said, and uh, the um, and the Bohr um, he will be making an ad hoc assumption. He will be uh, telling you something which leads to the correct result, but um, but. He, he, along the process, he has to make an assumption to which, like, if you ask him, why did you make this assumption, the only answer he can give you is, well, it gives you the correct result. Um, and actually, speaking of correct results, so, you know, the, the fact that hydrogen atom is stable, it, just simply explaining that is easy, right? Um, I mean, so this particular model leads to an absurd prediction, but maybe this is just not the correct model. Maybe the plum pudding model is actually correct. Or maybe um, some other model, like atom being made up of spheres, hard spheres like this. Maybe that's the correct result. Um, so this is where the, the science of a spectroscopy is actually helpful. That's what this uh, particular simulation that I downloaded um, would show. It sort of tells you different predictions that different models of uh, atom would result. It's uh, sort of dealing with uh, how this uh, hypothetical atom would uh, interact with the light. And uh, let me show you the spectrum so that you have a background for what I'm talking about. Let me pass out this diffraction grading. How many here have seen atomic spectra? I think I've shown that in this class once, right? Was it with the helium? Do you remember? OK. Let me show you the hydrogen spectrum. So, oh, I guess if you would uh, take one and pass the rest around, while it goes around, let me set up the hydrogen tube here so that you can see what the hydrogen spectrum looks like. Um, And so, you know, it's uh, kind of easy to come up with a theory that says your atom should be stable. That seems like that's not a high bar to uh, clear. Because, like, it, it, that's a, um, yeah. But what's a more difficult to bar to clear is explaining something more quantitative. Not merely the fact that your atoms don't implode, which is an absurd result for a theory to predict in the first place. But you have some experimental phenomenon that you see with atoms that now the goal is to explain. Why do we see that? So, um, so this is the hydrogen tube. People have been playing with this for a while. It, when you turn it on, it produces this light. Magenta light, people have seen that. Uh, for a long time. By the way, I kind of have to, uh, I can't leave this on for a long time. I'm going to turn it off um, so that I have a little time to explain what I want you to do. So take this diffraction grading, hold it horizontally right in front of your eye. Uh, when I turn this on, look at it directly. You will just see the magenta light. But as you're looking at it directly, look to your left or right. Then you will see the line spectrum that's spread out. Okay. I, can turn it on for 30 seconds and then I'll have to turn it off again. So look, so those line spectrum and the, everyone sees those line spectrum? What colors do you see? You see red and green? Do you see blue? Yeah, yeah like a cyan or, oh, I guess what you're calling green is actually probably cyan. And there's a more deeper blue there, right? So, um, so do, that's the spectrum of a hydrogen. And measuring that is the science of spectroscopy. And 
uh, people have been measuring that for a very long time. And that leads to a kind of uh, predictions. It leads to the prediction of, well, if an atom has a particular structure, then the atom is going to interact with the light in such a way that it emits those specific wavelengths of light. And when you play with this, this simulation, you will see that with the plum pudding model, it doesn't have any, it doesn't interact with any particular wavelength in a preferential way. It's just bouncing, the light particles are just bouncing off of this hard surface. And when you choose the plum pudding model, then this also doesn't really uh, interact selectively with the light. Any light coming in, any oscillation, shakes this electron and scatters. And when you have the, the solar system model, then you know it goes kaboom. That's the absurd one. Uh, what we are going to look at now is the Bohr model. This is the model that um, led to the correct prediction of energies, which leads to the correct prediction of uh, energies, which leads to the correct pre prediction of frequencies, which leads to the correct prediction of the wavelengths that you are seeing. So uh, let me describe the Bohr model. I think uh, we'll all get as far as I can before the second break. And then we might have to wrap it up after the second break. So this is um, kind of a starting place for the Bohr model. And so I will sketch the model, and then I will um, point out what the quantum mechanical ad hoc assumption he's making is. So this is the Bohr model. Mm. model of hydrogen. So he actually starts from this solar system model. So you start out with, all right, I'm going to have the atomic nucleus that has all of the positive charge at the very center. This is what we'll end up calling proton. So all right, you have the proton here. And the electron is going to be in orbit around um, this proton. So you have electron that's in orbit around the proton. Oops. Uh. And if that's a, sorry, I can't draw a circle today. Um, if that's all you have, then you get the same absurd result before. So Bohr has to put in one more assumption on top of this to avoid this result. And this is a strange, um, strange assumption that he's making, which um, you can defend it actually two different ways. Um, you can defend it on the basis that it gives you the correct result. <laughs> you can defend it on the basis that uh, it's equivalent to, to one other assumption that you have already seen. So let me do it both ways. So let me first start by stating the assumption. So this is uh, Bohr's assumption. Bohr's uh, quantum mechanical assumption. And it goes without saying it's an ad hoc assumption. If you asked him for, you know, why do you think that's true? His answer would be, well, it gives me correct prediction. <laughs> Actually, correct quote unquote prediction because it's not really a prediction. It's just reproducing what you already see experimentally. And in fact, uh, this is such a um, strange idea that there were uh, some physicists, Stern and Gerlach, that uh, set out to test this idea. And what they said to each other was that if Bohr's idea uh, happened out, turned out to be correct, they will quit physics. They didn't actually quit physics. But it was strange enough that um, it, it didn't, it's not something that came to people naturally. So this is his assumption. He's saying, all right, this electron, it's in orbit. It has a mass. So, it has an angular momentum, right? So he said angular momentum 
uh, let me assign a letter L of electron comes in discrete quantities. That's the assumption he made. And once you make that assumption, you kind of look at um, what other, um, how you can discretize this uh, angular momentum. And this is not the first time somebody said this quantity that we used to treat as continuous can take any value, comes in units of something. I mean, you know, it's right there. So the first time somebody tried to quantize it this way, they used this Planck's constant. Well, Planck did it, and he gave, we now call it Planck's constant. So this discretization of angular momentum is done on a similar basis. I'm going to write down an expression which won't really be um, intuitive, but we'll get to it later. So mathematically, you would say this. This angular momentum, it comes in integer units so of n. So this is integer. It comes in integer units of this, n times Planck's con constant divided by 2 pi. Sorry, there's a 2 pi in there for some reason. <laughs> so actually, this particular combination of constants happen a lot in quantum mechanics. So kind of like with gamma in special relativity, we give this a special, um, special letter. It's called H. It's H bar, or if you want to spell it out, mathematical calls this reduced the Planck uh, constant. So in terms of this, uh, this is what Bohr assumed, that angular momentum of this electron comes in these discrete quantities, n h bar. So I guess Bohr was somehow assuming that, um, so with this model in mind, um, could you have this angular momentum to be zero? Now, if you are a chemistry major, you might know something from chemistry that, you know, in the S orbital, electron has zero angular momentum. I want you to forget about that for the time being. In this particular physical model we are building, is n equals zero a possible um, um, possibility? It's not. This is one aspect of Bohr's model that is actually wrong. So Bohr's model is not the correct quantum mechanics. It's a stepping step. It's a stepping stone to the correct quantum mechanic. So that'll be the one thing about Bohr's model that's not quite right. So what's the smallest number you could have for n? You want to put something in orbit. We said this can only be an integer. One is the smallest number it can be, right? If a zero is out of the question. Yeah, so, so that would be the smallest uh, value n can be. And for the chemistry majors here, we actually retain this notation. This, in chemistry, this is what you call principal quant quantum number. Principal quantum, I have to spell it out, quantum number. And when you look at the periodic table, Um, this is the n, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, the little part that Bohr got wrong was that you could have n equals one and the angular momentum be equal to zero. So we'll get to that, but I want to just to show you that this plus what you know in classical mechanics leads to the correct result. So this is really, um, this is what we want to derive. We want to derive an expression for energies of this electron. So we want to say, you know, when this electron is in one particular orbit with n equals one, we want to be able to say this has energy E1, right? And we want to say if it's on some different orbit with n equals two, we want to say it has energy E2. And if it's on an even larger orbit, then you know you keep going with that on a larger. It, they, it's not drawn to scale, by the way. On this larger orbit with n equals three, we want to say it has energy e three, and this is really what we um, 
to compare this against this prediction in quote unquote prediction in spectroscopy you have seen, this is what we want to be able to say. We want to be able to say the difference between these energy levels. For example, E3 minus E2 gives you, so you know, as electron goes from here and somehow goes down into this lower level, as it's doing that, it's going to emit a photon. It's going to emit photon or light as it's doing that. And you want, we want to say that this difference in the energy levels of the electron is where the energy of the photon, H times frequency of, I don't know, hydrogen spectrum. comes from. Yeah? So the starting place here is that is we need to we need to drive an expression for the energy of the electron as a function of this parameter n. So that will take a little bit of time. We have to review some classical mechanics and go through not that complicated of an algebra, but um, since it's about the time for a break, let's Take the break now, and when we come back at three, we'll go through the short derivation to see what the expression for the total energy of the electron is, and how that agrees with what people measured experimentally in spectroscopy.